previously, my learned colleague has not had the opportunity to go through the papers. Can we just give me five minutes just to go through this, please? Mm -hmm.
by the way. Um, Thank you. Just so you know, to go back later and, and watch the sound of you know, there'll be a link on the part of the council website, which will take you through to the recording. This is wonderful. We're back in the end. Now today's hearing is pursuant to section 181 and the 12th schedule of the Local Government Act regarding the higher water. Um, the purpose of this report is to seek a decision as to whether Council should, pursuant to clause 1E of schedule 12, either abandon the works proposed or proceed with the works proposed uh, in the absence of holding land owner's consent and with an objection having been received. Okay. Um, the recommendation is just a repeat of that, just setting out on what your files are, which is to accept the work are required to proceed. It should not be abandoned or advised whether there should be any alterations made on the proposed work or record that the persons who are agreed by the determination of service authority under clause one need to proceed with the work proposed may appeal to the district court against the determination within 14 days after the date of determination. The background to this is that the Kasaya Water Project uh, has an objective to provide long-term security of potable water over, uh, for over 5,000 people and businesses in Kasaya. Uh, the Bond District Council is seeking to build a 13.5 kilometre pipeline from the ball field at Sweetwater to Kasaya Water Treatment Plant. The project also provides drought resilience to the people of Kartaya, and it is considered important to be to bring this capability online quickly. As currently proposed, the pipeline needs to cross two allotments which are owned by Albury Holdings Limited. Uh, the notice that pursuant to section 181 and one clause one and twelve schedule um, is for the Birds Road property. Uh, the other property, the El uh, Albury Holdings, has never objected to, and I just wish to make that quite clear that um, my understanding is that Albury Holdings has never been opposed to the project. It is purely opposed to the particular route that's been proposed over the land. So, in accordance with schedule, uh, accordance with clause 1D of the 12th schedule, Albury's have objected to the works. The pursuant to clause uh, 1D of the schedule, the authority needs to appoint a day for a hearing, which is today, and the territorial authority must hold a meeting on that day appointed and may, after hearing any person making any objection, if present, determine to abandon the works proposed or to proceed with the works proposed with or without any alteration that the territorial authority thinks fit. The council hearing meeting was scheduled for the 10th of November. It was postponed until today on the 14th, of actually, I think the 23rd of November. It was then postponed to the 10th, uh, to today, the 14th of December. And the, the, the options. Council has proposed two options or two routes. Okay, its preferred route, which is the, the most direct route. And my learned friend will take you through these routes when he actually addresses uh, Mr. Hillier, our consultant, will take you through the routes. Uh, Elria has objected uh, as it then goes through the Titan, and my understanding is that they believe that that will cause the problems in the future with the pipeline over their property. Um, the second option is the route previously agreed uh, with another landowner, but allowing for a small alignment adjustment given that Albury may wish to plant avocado trees in the future in the affected area piece of land. Uh, this route or option uh, would cost Council an extra $120,000. Council has previously advised that they were prepared to carry this additional cost. The key reason this route was rejected was because landowners did not want the route crossing through their property and potentially impacting on their future land plan, uh, land development plans. Albury, through their lawyer Rick Palmer, uh, proposed two alternative routes. A southern route, which passes closely to the lake. Uh, council discounted the southern route near the lake as proposed, 
that it posed a number of serious problems in terms of extra length, with the added cost of increasing the pipe class being approximately $330,000, a plus redesign cost, and added labor costs. Further, given the environmental standards, it's unlikely to gain resource consent approval to scale the pipe, so near to the lake. The second route that was proposed is that of the northern route along the northern boundary of the Bird Road property. The northern route was also rejected by Council. The northern route is a kilometre longer. This route would result in the pipe being located next to the drain rather than in it. Further, it would need to be approximately five metres distance from the shelter belt. It requires a redesign and also requires an increase in pipe class. It may also require an increase in the size of the pipe and tunnels, but this can only be determined once the engineering design has been completed. The associated costs of this route have been estimated at approximately 600,000. Uh, Ma'am, I'd now like to call on Mr. Hillier to actually address Council and lead a slide presentation and we'll take you through the details of what has been proposed. Thank you. Lee, where are your hands? Thank you. So, um, taking you through the first slide, I thought it would be good to just re recap the objective of the project and the purpose. Um, essentially, it's a water resilience project, and it's about protection for the people of Kaitaia against drought. What I'd like to do is, is take you today through the project timeline. Uh, have an overview of the preferred route and some of the other options that we've reviewed as part of that. So moving on to my next slide, what you're looking at here, the light blue boxes are kind of project activities and key milestones that we've gone through, and the dark blue boxes are key interactions with the landowners, Mr and Mrs King. It should be noted that that's not all of the interactions that we've had during this time, they're detailed in the chronology that's been provided to everyone here. So the, this start or iteration of the project, uh, its current guys, started in June 2019 with a council resolution to confirm Sweetwater is the preferred option. Uh, we engaged the design partner in WSP in October, and they completed an option report uh, by March 2020, uh, which verified that uh, Sweetwater was still that preferred option. During April, um, since we had a route, we then uh, went out to start to do our design on that and to engage with landowners um, to, to find that, that preferred option through there. Unfortunately, we were in the coronavirus pandemic, the level four lockdown at the time, um, which gave us some delays. We offered to meet online, but that was uh, unacceptable to the landowners. It wasn't a preferred means of communication. Uh, and they were also classified as an essential service and they were carving at the time. So we couldn't meet them until the end of May, unfortunately. Um, during May, we met with them um, to go through the preferred routes and then take you through the details of that meeting afterwards. But we also released an RMA registration of interest into the market, which was a first stage in a procurement process. The reason we did that at that time was to test the market because we didn't know what the market's capability was after the coronavirus pandemic, who, who was interested, who was not interested, and what the current capabilities were. So it was quite important for us to signal to the market that it was coming and to understand what the current capability in the market was. Uh, in June, we received a letter from the landowners, uh, which we responded to in, in July with all of those questions. Um, and we also concluded our ROI process uh, to get some shortlisted bidders ready for when we started the next stage, which is a, an RFT, a request for tender. Um, during August, uh, we were asked not to talk to Elbury Holdings until we secured the land. Um, and also until uh, we had a secure the funds. And we needed to go to council for this uh, and we needed to complete our design, detailed design to get that. We should say that um, we delayed the RFT for a couple of weeks going out uh, to enable us to go to council. We'd have 
we applied for funding as part of the shovel ready projects, but that was unsuccessful, so they had to get back to council for that. And we also uh, delayed it for a further two weeks past that to give us additional time to talk to the landowners and to inform them that the RFP was going into the market and to try to get to a resolution. Um, at the end of August, we took the decision that we were not making sufficient progress and we were struggling to engage. So at that stage, we uh, started the procurement process, uh, which is this process that we're in the landowners, with the expressed intention to still come to a negotiated agreement, which, is, which has always been our preference. Since that notice, uh, there have been communication between both parties, and both parties have worked to try and find a solution. Um, LB Holdings did request to meet with councillors rather than myself, Chris Palmer and Mr. Swanepoel. Um, that couldn't be arranged in September due to availability, but we started that at the 6th of October. It's worth saying that we did have a number of discussions during September where the Avocado route, which is, is the 2010 route of site modifications, was identified as an opportunity. We met uh, with the elected members and uh, all of the landowners on the 6th of October. And again, on the 9th of October, we walked the routes on the land and had some discussions uh, regarding opportunities regarding the power. Um, the problem with the, the route across the paddocks is that Eldry Holdings needed to confirm the future of the cargo planting blocks, uh, and, and that needed to be resolved. <clears throat> Unfortunately, we struggled to maintain the momentum during October, uh, and we decided at the end of October to make the next step in the process. Uh, as Mr. Swan alluded to earlier, it was the uh, date of the 10th of November, and uh, that was moved due to the Albury Holdings availability. During November, we took online meetings with all of the landowners. Um, we were represented by Rick Parker, and this is Kim, who was able to attend on those. On the 13th, we received the alternative briefs from the Holdings. And we also took the decision to again, delay this hearing uh, until today to give more time to come to a negotiated agreement. On the 26th of November, we received an email from Bill Palmer on behalf of Elbury Holdings stating that the avocado route and our preferred route are no longer acceptable and the only route that would be acceptable to this person are the routes on the boundaries. The only other point is that we are concluding our procurement evaluation and we're ready to name a preferred tenderer and to start the contract once we've, we've resolved this uh, dispute if possible. So that's a, a summary of the high level milestones in the um, I'd like to take you through uh, the route if possible. So, starting off, just to orientate yourselves, um, you should be able to see this in front of you. And in the top left hand corner there is the land owned by Tony Hayward and the council has purchased uh, an area with two walls on it. Moving to the east of that there we go, is the land owned by Dennis Panther and then a private road, public road, third road here, private road, half owned by Dennis Panther and Mr Hayward. Then we move into land owned by Elbury Holdings. Bruce and Tracy Breton, and again by Elbury Holdings, and then Sand Hills Road is down here. To the south is the Tiger Swamp area, and this land is owned by the Takata. And what we will do is we'll overlay our preferred route here, 30 and a half kilometres. You can see it starts off at the Hayward boundary, across the fence line on, on Mr. Panther's property, and across the private road, and then following the fences and gate lines down here. This area here that we're looking at is the Peak Flats that has been put in stone to Mr. and Mrs. King. And then it follows their boundary, and Mr. Breton's boundary, and their boundary again, all the way to Sand Hills Road. Pros of this route is we believe it's the best value for the ratepayer. It's, it's the shortest and the least risk, and it's technically possible. Uh, the cons against this is it is through the middle of Elbury Holdings property, however it does align with the fences and the parcel boundaries that are provided to us. There is a question about the land and the perceived impact on farming operations. 
However, they do have a right to injurious affections under that and compensation under the Act may have an impact on their farm. They should not be out of sorts in any way for this. Our estimate is it will take around five weeks to go from uh, the boundary, the Hayward boundary to Sand Hills Road, and about three and a half weeks of that will be on LB Holdings property. The keep five weeks in the head for the, for the, for the whole area of that kind of plan. The other issue is the peak issue uh, raised by the landowner in this area here that we just talked <coughs> about. Uh, is there a view or an explanation on that species of species? Yes, if I may, thank you, everybody. Um, one of the One of the, we received two um, comments from the landowner when we did a, a site walk over um, with the surveyor and a representative from Farm of District Council uh, in this area to say that it's a highly saturated area. Um, so the groundwater is, is quite high and they've got drainage, groundwater drainage um, channels. Uh, in, the, in that um, paddocks to drain the water and they were concerned that if we have any uh, trenches there it would actually um, uh, damage uh, or um, have issues with drainage in, uh, into the existing channels. And the other comment was that it's possible for uh, the pipe uh, the pipes to float. Um, so what we did, we wrote a memo back to FNDC which uh, I believe was shared with with, with the landowners to say that um, technically it's not a problem. First of all, the, um, the material um, which we will use for backfill would either be the existing peat uh, or a, um, a backfill material which we will bring in, which will have a, a expect, expect or better uh, permeability. So it will the flow of water through it would be similar. Also around the pipe itself, we've got uh, what we call an um, AP20, which is a, a backfilling uh, kind of material, which also allows for flow of water quite um, easy through it. So we said we, we do not expect that to be a problem, that, um, that drainage will be uh, hampered through the existing panels. The other thing was about the pipe flotation. Um, uh, we specifically uh, um, in our contract document or the tender document said that the contractor will have to deal with that to make sure the trench remains um, dry so they will have to um, get rid of groundwater during construction and uh, once construction is done and the backfill is, is back uh, placed back over the pipeline it will not be a problem also remember the pipeline will have water in it um, in terms of maintenance, if there's a maintenance and the pipeline is drained, it will be a, a few hours. Again, you're going to have between one to two meters of fill above the pipeline, and it won't be issued. It's not going to, it's not going to float. Um, so those were the two main concerns. Uh, technically, it's possible to build there. We, as a company, have and in New Zealand there are more than enough examples of kilometers of pipelines that's been built through peat. Uh, uh, so from a technical perspective, we're not too concerned about uh, this issue. Uh, I just want to add one thing that we did unfortunately not have um, access to the property to do uh, geotechnical investigations. So um, a lot of this, what I've just shared with you, is because it's due to our previous experience working in peat. Um, so it's not because we've got scientific supporting documentation with that in this, this specific area. Uh, moving on. So I have part of our assessment on our meeting on the 25th of May. We've put a number of options on the table. Uh, hopefully you can see it here. We're actually looking at that purple route. Well, is your pointer working? I've not seen a red light here. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, there it is. It's if, it, if it's not showing up here, could I ask that you actually walk over to the one on the wall? Oh, I'm, I I have walked the site, but some of my colleagues have not. So I'm able to get their bearings. The, the pointer is working there. Just pushing the point is working there. I'll, I'll, I'll be honest, it's the operator around my finger, but I'm, yeah, <laughs> if I'm not speaking. 
So I, I'll admit that on record was not to say. Um, we were actually preparing this purple route up here, but we modified it after discussions with Mr. Panther to follow the fence line uh, and, and also to the boundaries after our, our conversation with, with Albert Collins. They did ask us to have a look at the route along the northern boundary, so this is the light blue and the, the green route down here on, on Kanuchi Road. We discounted both of those on a desktop assessment because of the additional cost and the length of one kilometre. Um, and we also, at the time, discounted this route, which is a modification of the 2010 route, the green route, um, because we thought this area here uh, was potentially used for, for avocados, and it was also a longer route. Um, after our discussions on the 9th of October, this, this was uh, indicated in, in, in September, the blue one again is our preferred route, just for orientation. We were looking at this route, and it, it was an option at the time, I believe, uh, going through through this, this paddock, and there, there was some discussions about aligning to the future avocado parcels. And this route here, the red route, um, was also one which, which, which followed the boundary that we hold and then back on that boundary there. Now, the pros of both of the green and red routes is that they avoid this peat area, which is concerns of our area. And the pro of the red route is it's on the, the boundary, which is acceptable to healthy holdings, it's not going through, through this area here. Um, the cons of the green route is that the avocado, the, the, the development of what the areas would look like was not yet complete. Um, just skip forward a little bit. And there's also some consenting challenges on that red route. And Larry, I might ask you to talk to those as well if that's possible. So, as part of the process, uh, the design process, we uh, went through a uh, planning and resource consent um, activities um, where we looked at um, perfect consent and also just resource consent. Uh, two items that, uh, or two uh, um, guidelines that, that specify that the rules here would be the, the uh, Northern Regional Council's uh, specifications as well as the, the new environmental standards, freshwater, which was launched in or approved in September, sorry, came into effect in September 2020. Um, both of those uh, is for the protection of wetlands. Um, so uh, it, it does, it does uh, refer to any vegetation clearance or construction activities within 10 meters from a uh, natural wetlands, which the Lake Rotorua um, is, is being specified as a significant wetlands. Um, it also says that anything uh, between 100 meters setback from a wetlands, uh, you know, will be um, a discretionary activity if it's uh, a results or likely to result in complete or partial drains of any part of the, the wetlands or taking damming, diversion, discharge of water within or within, or within 100 meters setback from the natural wetlands. So, what, what we're saying is just there, are, there is a risk that a resource consent will be. Um, uh, may not be approved due to the fact that we will have to scour um, into the, uh, well, basically if we follow the red route, we're going to um, scour almost directly into the lake. Um, so that's a problem. Also, the other problem is that due to um, the resource activity, you need uh, to have stakeholder engagement with the local iwi, and we also foresee uh, possible objections from having water scoured directly into the lake. Uh, so those are so. Uh, what we're saying is there is a possible risk of resource issues and consenting issues that goes with it. And the last con on the red route is, is the risk of home size and height class increase. So what that means is uh, by increasing the length of the route. Um, there is a risk that we either have to put in a bigger pipe or a thicker pipe, so thicker being pipe class and uh, um, greater diameter being pipe size. And that's a material cost, mainly, that, that, that can be quite significant if you have to go up on those two things. Um, and we've got the additional things. So 
additional options that were raised by the email on the 23rd of November. So this is uh, LB Holland, the current position that the, the blue group, the preferred group, and the green group, the second preferred group, which, which we were hoping was the compromise, uh, are no longer acceptable. And the light blue route, which is the one along the northern boundary and along the county drain here, and then the red route. It's worth pointing out here that the red route is modified slightly. It's, it's no longer lining back up with the green route in this boundary, going to the west of the Tiger Swamp uh, and meeting up the Sand Hills Road further south. We've not actually costed this route at the moment because of the issues here with the consent of this, if you will. Um, we've done some additional work on the light blue route, so just to talk about that. <coughs> We, looked at, uh, we broke down the, the estimated costs in terms of construction, property, redesign. Construction, we, we used two estimates. One was our top-down estimate, um, using the numbers we used in the auctioneering process. But we've also benchmarked those against prices from, from recent contracts. We think it's between 360 and 420k. We asked the property group for a desktop assessment on additional distance. We'll pick up somewhere between 85 and 105, and there's a cost for the redesign for, uh, from WSP, uh, somewhere between 50 and 70k, depending on the amount of technological work that we need to do. That's based on a previous offer to look at the avocado market and scaled slightly um, for those ones, which gives us a total estimated cost of between 500 and 600k. Um, it's worth pointing out, and, and Elbury Hoggins have pointed out to us, that the route along the northern boundary we would not need to thrust under the airstrip or under the Tiger Swamp area. Um, we would be able to, to, to trench the entire way. That's about 300 metres. Um, difference in price is about $100 a metre, so it's about 30k saving. And that, that's, a, that's a genuine saving off the most numbers. The big risks that we have, again, is pipe class and pipe size. We won't know the, the impact until we've done the engineering on this, but these numbers, uh, $22 a metre, if we go up the pipe size, that's based off of quotes I, I gave in uh, Heimsering in Tomare and said, what's the difference? They gave it off the book price, not the actual price for the 40 kilometres, so it, it, it may reduce slightly, but it's roughly $22 a metre, which is about 320 k the pipe class number we had was $24 a metre off of previous projects because it's a non-standard pipe, so they needed to come back to us with a quote. And there's a lead time because it's a non-standard pipe for about two months. I can confirm that this meeting, frankly, one of the is actually $20 a metre, not $24 a metre, um, has been quoted to us. So rather than 350k, it's about 280 to 90k off the top of my head, but that's over and above those numbers on the left, if we need it. So that's that's the risk we're playing with. We haven't bothered costing the increase in OPEX, which is the additional power for pumping. Um, we will probably have to increase the pump size. However, it's 10 to k It's negligible in terms of those other risks. And uh, we have assumed that the potential change in, in route is acceptable to the other landowners. So, Mr. Hayes, Mr. Kaplan, and Mr. Britton, there's a big difference on Mr. Britton's land um, with, with where we were and where we're potentially going. The shoot is acceptable to them. Uh, Mr. and Mrs. King have raised a number of issues with us. These are uh, pretty standard easement conditions. We sent a response on the 16th and also the 23rd of October. Um, however, we've not enough close. That have not been confirmed as, as resolved and acceptable to Mr. and Mrs. King at this point in time. We can go into that and all these other questions. Um, so, to summarise, the four routes that we've discussed the blue route is our preferred, the green is the avocado, it's roughly 120k more. However, we need to agree to uh, agree the future avocado parcel, so in terms of design. <coughs> this is Kenya at the stage. The light group group on the northern boundary is, is between 500 and 600k more with significant risk uh, increase if those other risks come to pass. And I believe 
It's likely that one of those will come to pass, although I've not completed the engineering on that. And the red uh, cost here, I put in the 380k, was that red route that went along the lake and then came back along the north tiger swamp, not very south of the center of the road. It's around 820 meters north, and we've got those large percentage risks. And still, the risk of pipe size and glass increases to that number. However, it's a short route, so a slightly lower chance for that happening. So, to summarise where we're at at the moment, two routes are acceptable to the council the preferred blue route and the green route. All of these are cost prohibited and will have engineering and consenting risks. However, it is FMDC priority to resolve this so we can construct construction contract and commence uh, construction in the summer with a view to getting the pipeline in place for the next summer for that drought resilience and that protection for the people of the country. That's the end of my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Mark. Do you have any questions? <coughs> No, I'd, I'd rather just get on with my submission. Um, Thank you. Are you ready? Um, my colleagues around the table, does anybody at the table have any questions over the train at this time? Mr. Hulia and the guard to have presentation.
prior to there being any agreement on route. And I'm told, I, I, I hear Mr Hillier to say today that Council are now ready to name the tenderer. And they haven't even got this process under Section 181 completed. And it just seems to me that the way in which um, the process has been handled has been utterly appalling from my client's point of view. Um, so a lot of what I've said there is reflected in the written submissions that I make, but I'll run through them now so that everybody can hear those. So Albury objects to the current Farnell District Council proposing to lay a water pipeline across its property. It objects because the proposed route runs right through the middle of the Elbury farm and it's not correct that it follows um, parcel boundaries. It runs right through the middle of the farm. There are two separate farms. There are a number of titles on those farms that it isn't correct to say that the proposed pipeline uh, follows parcel boundaries. It runs through the middle of the farm. Um, it will affect the ability of the farm to produce in the future. Uh, there are reasonable alternatives which follow either property the boundaries or the council drains, which would not have the same detrimental effects on the future use of the property. One of the alternative routes is Route A, uh, in the um, Mr Hillier's memorandum dated 4 November 2020, and that memorandum records the route is 2,100 metres uh, short. Perhaps I should just take it to that orange route. I could just pass around yeah, a copy yeah. of the <coughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
So, um, the, um, one of the alternative routes is Route A, which is the orange route. You can see on the left-hand side of the page, um, it records, the memorandum records that this route is 2,100 metres shorter, but incorrectly states that it has to go through the Tiger Swamp. The route can actually go through pasture land, no different from um, the Elbury pasture. There was no explanation given as to why this route would take longer to implement due to landowner negotiations. Uh, the red route, which was suggested by um, Elbury, but was discounted with no site visit. That's also shown on that um, on that plan. So Elbury is willing to help the community. Um, However, the proposal will have severely adverse impact on the operation of the farm. Elbury believes that it is the only party currently that will be badly affected by the proposed pipeline route. Every other property, <coughs> except for the Panther property, uh, the pipeline route follows the property boundaries. Um, Elbury, Elbury is particularly concerned with the loss of flexibility over the use of the productive land on the farm. The farm is used for a variety of uh, purposes, including dairy farming, crop growing, and a proposed avocado orchard. The current pipeline proposed by Farnold District Council runs right through the middle of the land that is going to be planted with avocados. If it is suggested that any pipeline needs to be five metres from a shelter belt, that would mean that a further 10, a more than 10 metre strip of unusable land through the middle of a future avocado orchard. The presence of the pipeline running through the farm will open up the farm to outsiders coming onto and through the middle of the farm to inspect, maintain or repair the pipeline. This is unnecessary, has significant adverse effects on the farm operation and is a security risk. Now, in relation to the process, the company objects to the way in which the matter has been raised and handled by the Barnock District Council. Elbury considers that the process adopted by Council has been flawed and that Elbury has been disadvantaged by that flawed process. The Council approach has been dominated by its perceived need to proceed with the construction of works on private land without delay at the expense of securing agreement in advance and open, transparent communication with the landowners including Elbury. So back in 2011 and 2012, Farnock District Council actually installed a bore on private land with no legal ownership. The original project was shelved by the Farnock District Council in 2012. Uh, the council failed to purchase the land in the company Sweetwater and it then lost all of the land access rights at a substantial cost to ratepayers. My understanding is that cost to ratepayers was $2 million, roughly. And now it's been said to this Elbury that the council can't afford to take a more expensive option, having wasted $2 million on a previous um, contract. Uh, FNDC then incurred further substantial expenditure last year, obtaining an emergency water supply from Iwi and tried to activate the sweet water um, bore site, which did not actually uh, deliver any water to Kaitaia. So further funds, I'm not sure how much was spent last year in that arrangement. Uh, so it, it doesn't sit well with Elbury when council say that, their preferred, that the, the Elbury preferred options are too expensive. Council have wasted a lot of money already on these arrangements, and that's not Elbury's responsibility to, take, uh, to, to be affected by that. So, the Council then installed Bore 2 last month, which is still without owning the land on which the bores are situated. The Council knew it may have to acquire land and or easements under the Public Works Act to get water off the site in the Kaitai. So the rush to proceed with this pipeline proposal is a result of failed final district council policy and practice with respect to sweet water. 
if in this case it's Elbury to pay the price of its past failures rather than routing the pipeline along property boundaries or roads. Agreement on the pipeline route and the necessary land and easement acquisition should have come first. Instead, the pipeline route was proposed, plans were drawn up before any communication with affected landowners. The engineering and design plans were completed remotely in an office. No engineers walked the route before submitting the plan and have still not done so. One of the things that was said by one of the early speakers was that they don't know the actual impact of the Elbury preferred routes until they have done the engineering. Well, it seems to me that the engineering work should have been done first before you get to this stage. They should have all of that information about the preferred routes already so that council can make an informed decision about which route would be appropriate. There's a suggestion that there are engineering and consenting risks. But they've already, they've already issued a, re a request for tenders on another route without assessing the risks and engineering and consenting risks in this route on the preferred routes. And the consenting issues could be addressed by getting a planning assessment done by a fully qualified and experienced planning person. Council simply haven't done that investigation because what they have done is they've decided on a route and they've pushed headlong towards that route without taking into account or doing any in-depth analysis of any other route. So um, along, and along those lines, the, the, the Kings have found that communication with council has been extremely frustrating. Um, Whānau District Council should have consulted with owners regarding potential pipeline routes and the easements that will be sought over their land before drafting detailed plans and having those plans costed. Elbury understands that Mr Hillier was engaged in about July 2019 and I think that's drawn out in this Mr Hillier's presentation. It says June 2019. Um, Elbury was first contacted in April 2020 during the first COVID lockdown. It was an essential service carving a thousand plus cars and was a closed unit. No outsiders were allowed to enter its bubble. So consultation at that point was extremely important. They had their first meeting with Farnworth District Council on the proposal on 20 May. I think that's completely unacceptable. This proposal has been underway within council offices since June 2019, and the first meeting with the people that are affected is uh, May 2020. By that time, pipeline hands had, plans had already been produced. Uh, they were dated 24 March 2020. They showed two alternative routes, both of which ran through the middle of the farm. At that time, no one from FNDC had approached Elbury, the owner of the land, through which Farnell District Council proposed laying a pipeline and acquiring easements. Shortly afterwards, Council invited express expressions of interest for the pipeline contract based on that proposal, which had not been agreed with affected landowners, including Elbury. Property Group, letter dated 15 May 2020, raised the possibility with Elbury of an easement for the Kaitaia Water Project. It stated that the construction of the pipeline was planned to commence in November 2020. At this point in time, no easements have been obtained and, and the route itself was not finalised. So it's another example of people working for council to pursue this proposal getting ahead of themselves. Following the meeting on 20 May 2020, a number of relevant questions were raised by Elbury 
and other affected landowners by email dated 16 June 2020. Prior to those questions being answered, TPG emailed Elbury with a plan dated 17 June, which provided for one proposed route right through the centre of the farm. Clearly, the Farm Off District Council did not take the discussions with affected landowners seriously. They simply pressed on with their preferred route, which had been arrived at without any consultation with affected landowners. Farnock District Council then put the pipeline contract up for expression of interest prior to reaching any agreement with the affected landowners regarding the route or indeed access to private property. By letter dated 28 August 2020, Farnock District Council requested access to the property for contractors to enable them to tender. Mr and Mrs King were contacted by tenderers late in August, September 2020, wishing to access the property for the purpose of tendering for the project. Access was refused because at that point, no agreement had been reached regarding the route and or the easement rights. At this time, the Farnall District Council did not even own the land on which the board sit. Even now, Farnall District Council but on my understanding, don't own the land from which the water is sourced. Mr and Mrs King understand that FNDC has no signed access agreements with any other of the owners. The correspondence from FNDC repeatedly referred to constraint, time constraints and the need to complete the project within the program time frame, despite there being no agreement on the route. FNDC issued to contractors a request to tender for construction of the project before any agreement was reached on the route. Council also had a committee for the Kaitai water supply that was meeting regularly throughout this period. At no time has Albury ever had any correspondence or communication from them. WPS applied for a resource consent on the 29th of September 2020. It was approved on October 2020. The resource consent shows the preferred route crosses the Tiger Flats on Elbury land. This is page, actually, uh, page 13 there, but I think when I read through the resource, I think it's page 11. Um, clause 2.2.1 refers to the paper road, which is to be upgraded for heavy traffic. This is not a paper road. It's an access road lot belonging to the Panthers and the Havens. Clause 7.1.4 states that no work will commence without first obtaining all landowners' approval through granting of access on private land. So resource consent has already been obtained when the route hasn't been determined. It's an astonishing way to go about um, doing business. There are alternative routes. The email from the Farnal District Council to Albury dated 12 May stated, where possible, the existing legal road will be used for the pipeline. However, in some cases, the pipeline alignment from the bore source to the Qatar water treatment plant must cross private land. The email suggests that the Elbury property is one of those where the alignment has no reasonable alternative to cross, but to cross private land. This is wrong. There are reasonable alternatives which either follow the existing roads or property boundaries, or in one case, the county drain. Uh, however, from the outset, FNDC has been fixated on a route which goes straight through the middle of the Elbury farm. Attached to the submission is a plan showing alternative options which would go, not go through the middle of the farm. Just, that's on the last page. Um, the red route along the bottom, you see that it differs from the route that was shown on Mr Hillier's slide. Um, the slide that is here, additional options after the 9 October site meeting, shows essentially the red route coming off the green route. That is not what was proposed by Mr and Mrs King. What was proposed by Mrs King is shown on the plan, uh, which is at, at the end of my submission, and it runs straight from the wall site, straight down, uh, and then carries on. 
So Route A is the preferred route. It follows the western boundary of the farm. It creates the least disadvantage to the operation of the farm. If the council agreed to this option, Albury would waive any claim for compensation. Now, just note that the various costings that have been put in play by Mr Hilliard on the screen don't take into account the fact that Albury waived any right to compensation on that route. And compensation for an easement could be substantial. Uh, the the um, valuations, Albury simply doesn't accept the valuation produced so far by TPG. It's a desktop valuation. It bears absolutely no uh, realistic um, similarity to the real value of these properties. Um, the compensation payment would be significantly greater than it's set out in that situation. Mr. Martin, so, I just asked you when you talk about Route A. It's the red route. That's the red route of your map. Yeah. Thank you. Well, that's just a it's the red route. Oh, it's no. not the one on the map because that was, you just said that that wasn't the one that was proposed. No, no, it's no. The down in the board. On the last page of my submission, there's a plan attached. Oh, okay, sorry. Yeah. No, I see. That's the red route. <laughs> Route A would connect with the Landcourt Farm, uh, which is in general title, although it's owned by Ewing. It provides for a relatively straight line to Kaitai. Alternatively, it can, it can connect with Sandals Road with no thrusting or wet landing. Route B is the second preference. This is the northern boundary route. It runs along the northern boundary of the property to the Brereton property, runs down the Brereton property to Kunison Road. This would have some impact on the farm in that it would cross a number of fence lines running from the boundary back into the farm, and so Elbury would be seeking compensation for injurious affection. I'm so we is that the yellow line? That's the yellow line. That's the yellow line. Route C is a third option. A is, the third option is a variation on Route B. It follows the northern boundary and then follows the Farnell District Council drainage district, FNDC drainage district county drain, down and, and the Brereton's driveway before reaching Sandhills Road. The county drain drains the land called farm and is always accessible. It is never going to be shifted and it provides for an excellent route for the pipeline for that reason. This route does not have significant impact on fences. And I think, Mr and Mrs King will correct me if I'm wrong, but one other slide showed before. The original... That's the county. So on the slide, Mr Hillier produced called uh, options assessed after the 20 May meeting. There's a light green line that essentially follows the northern bound, the northern boundary, and, and the the light, sorry, the light blue line, and where it's coming down towards Sandhills Road, that is following the county drain. And that's what you refer to as yeah. route C. Yes, that's right. Well, it's, it's yeah, it's a slight variation on that because it. it back towards the left-hand side of the page, but the, it follows the county drain as, follow, as shown in that plan. Yeah, that's right. So it's therefore not correct to assert, for council to assert that there is no reasonable alternative to the crossing of private land. There are in fact three reasonable alternatives and possibly more. The alternative routes suggested by Albury have only been the subject of desktop top analysis. 
No one from FNDC is asked to meet Mr. and Mrs. King and walk any of the proposed routes. The alternative routes involve the same landowners and will probably cost less, than the final, less as the final district council will not be thrusting through wetlands or under air, airstrips and cattle yards. Yet the alternatives are discounted as too expensive without proper consideration or analysis. I think Mrs. King wanted to point out to me earlier that there was some suggestion that there was th only 300 metres of thrusting under the airstrip, but in fact, um, my instructions are that there would be 700 um, metres of thrusting, including <coughs> the airstrip and the cattle yards. Is that right? In Breaton. In Breaton. Breaton's, Breaton. Breaton's wetland is approximately 330 metres, and the airstrip and under our yards is 350 to 400 metres, so it's approximately 700 metres of thrusting that would need to be done. That would be avoided if they followed one of these alternatives. And yeah, and the other thing I'd like to point out in George's last letter about needing a five metre easement width um, from away from shelter trees, which is which, which is continuous through whole, the whole papers. As questions answered, we were given before that um, the um, shelter building should engineers recommend that shelter buildings are planted two and a half metres from the actual pipeline. Um, so we keep getting conflicting things. One minute it's five because and very expensive for this route three, but in the previous questions and answers, it's only two and a half, so we don't know where we are. So just back to paragraph 25 of the submission. Uh, yet the alternatives are discounted as too expensive without proper consideration or analysis. There has clearly been predetermination by Farnham District Council of the preferred uh, pipeline route without any prior consultation with the landowners or any adequate assessment of the alternatives. And this is shown by the preparation of detailed plans before contact is made with the landowners. So, council response to those alternatives. There have been negotiations taking place between Farnham District Council and Albury regarding the best route for the pipeline. But by email dated 1 December, Farnham District Council addressed the two alternative routes proposed by Albury. The response was the southern route would require extra length, added cost of increasing the thickness of the pipe, plus redesign and added labour costs. No detail was provided. Any redesign and additional labour costs are the consequence of the flawed process followed by FNDC. The route had been agreed before the pipeline had been designed. Redesign and additional labour costs would have been avoided. They shouldn't be held against Albury. FNDC advised that it was unlikely to get a resource consent to construct the pipeline close to the, pipe, close to the lake. No detail was provided on what resource consent would be required to install a pipeline on a private property 20 to 30 metres from the lake edge. There has been no consultation with land, neighbouring landowners, so FNDC do not know whether a resource consent would be problematic. In addition, there has been no planning assessment made or obtained. This is a, this is a consequence of a flawed process. If the route had been agreed initially, then any consents required could have been obtained without landowner objections. The northern route is longer. The pipe will need to go next to a drain and five metres from the shelter belt. This is what Mrs King's point earlier. It also requires redesign costs and increased thickness of pipe. The only response to this is that the land that follows the county drain is already used as a driveway, has no fences, and is a clear for pipeline installation. Elbury questions how this can result in an increase in installation expense. Elbury did not suggest that the pipe would go into the drain, but alongside the county drain, which will already be covered by council drainage bylaws restraining or restricting building, tree planting, etc. Uh, within, I think it's 10 metres of a county drain. It will eliminate the changes to the design depth in the pit. The final district council engineer suggested the depth increase 
150 millimetres to 1.6 millimetres. It will eliminate thrusting through wetlands, which have kari stumps both above and below the surface, and for 300 metres through the airstrip and under the Elbury Yard. This should result in straight savings. The email provide a high-level breakdown of the costs, which are said to be $595,000, but this appears to be a back-of-the-envelope calculation without any detail or substantiated costings. It also does not factor in the potential benefits from the alternative northern route, nor differences in compensation for injurious infection arising from the, a pipeline through, through, through the middle of the farm. I now want to address you briefly on the legislation. So Section 181 1A authorised the local authority to construct works on, a private, on private land for the supply of water for reticulated means. The authority must not exercise the powers in Section 1811 unless it has either the prior written consent of the owner or it has complied with Schedule 12. There is no reported case, I couldn't find one, of a local authority relying on Section 181 for the installation of a pipeline for the supply of time. <coughs> what that means is I have been able to find a court case that reports on it. I, I accept that there may have been instances where agreement has been obtained and pursuant to this process, but I haven't found a, a disputed uh, authority on it. Section 181 provides for the authority for authority to carry out work, but it doesn't provide for an easement. Council will need to separately acquire easements, either by agreement or under the Public Works Act 1981, perhaps an agreement that can be a separate and additional process for the future. The normal process would be for council to determine the pipeline route, obtain the necessary easements, and then utilise those easements when constructing the works. It is an abusive process to construct the works under Section 181 before obtaining the easements under the Public Works Act 1981. Schedule 12 requires a description of the works accompanied by a plan of the works to be deposited for public inspection and placed within the district in which the works are to be undertaken. Elbury has not seen any public inspection of the plan and has no knowledge of any plan being dis deposited for public inspection within the Kaitar district. I don't know whether that's happened. I haven't, I've got no knowledge of it. But it's something that councillors need to think carefully about before reaching a decision. The process adopted by a Whanau District Council is therefore legally flawed. The correct approach would be to discuss possible routes with affected landowners, develop a route proposal and then obtain agreement, apply for easements pursuant to the Public Works Act 1981. Once the easement is acquired, commence work on the pipeline. Elbury questions where the final district council has followed its own council governance statements. The chief executive is the only person who can give instructions to staff members to carry out this process, and in order to do so, the chief executive would need to be or have been authorised by council. The council delegation to the chief executive by resolution dated 16 January 2014 authorised the chief executive to enter into contracts of up to $500,000 in value. Clearly, this project exceeds the Chief Executive's delegated authority. Elbury is unaware of any resolution of full council authorising council to proceed with the Kaitai Water Project. I see there is some mention in the first slide of a resolution to commence options report. But there's no record in that timeline of a resolution to proceed with the Kaitai Water Project. Elbury requires disclosure of any resolution, including any minutes, of any full council meeting which authorised the acquisition of easements over private land under the Public Works Act 1983. It also requires disclosure of any, of any resolution, including minutes of any full council meeting, authorising the commencement of this process under Section 181, Local Government Act 2002. 
There are no such resolutions. Elbury questions the authority under which the process has been being conducted. So where to from here? Council must recognise that any decision to pursue the Section 181 Local Government Act 2002 to commence construction of a pipeline through the middle of the Elbury Farm will be strenuously opposed. There will inevitably be delays and expense resulting from that opposition. With respect, uh, Council would be better served by working with the affected landowners including Elbury, to obtain prior agreement to the pipeline route, including agreement to the easements which FNDC still require. There is a substantial benefit to proceeding by agreement rather than pursuant to Section 181 of the Local Government Act 2002. And in my it, it could ultimately result in them being cheaper because you won't have the delay of the opposition and the defences and the appeals. You won't have the uh, potentially on one route, you wouldn't have to pay compensation. There's a, there are a big opportunities for council to obtain agreement, but they can't go through the middle of the farm. That is, that is the bottom line for Elbury. Do you have any questions? At this time, Mr. Martin, I'm going to, I'm going to talk 12.30. It is important that Mr. Swanepoel and Mr. Hamir and your advisors had the opportunity to go away and consider the matters that you've raised in your statement of evidence, and we will expect you to address those when we reconvene at 12.30. Thank you. Thank
necessary for council at this particular instance to actually get evidence, but however, council has to, in order to actually comply with being able to supply the plans and supply the route, actually have determined what the route is going to be. Otherwise, how could it actually fulfil its obligations under this section? It can't start a negotiation with, with people and say, well, this is maybe where we want to go, and this is what we're thinking. In order to fulfil its obligations in terms of the Act, it actually has to determine that route beforehand. It has to have a plan. It has to say to the people, this is where we want to go. And the, the, the owner of the land then says to us, hold on, there may be a better route, or may you consider X, Y, and Z. That is for Council to consider. And Council has appropriately, in this instance, I believe, considered those options. Okay. The issue is one of in jurisdiction. The issue is that they, they raise that this is a cost of supporting because of the fact that the values of lands and they don't accept the value of the land. There's a process for that that's set up in the Public Works Act. So let's make quite clear what that process is. The process is simple. Okay, we get a value. The value, independent value, he determines what the value is. They can get a value. The two values can meet. If they can't agree the value, then they have the right to go to the valuations tribunal. Okay. And the valuations tribunal will then determine what the value of the land is. It is not a negotiation. It is a process that we actually have to follow. That is the difference between working in the public sector and in the private sector. If we were private, yes, then the whole thing is open to negotiation. Yes, then we need to get the owner's permission to cross their land. And you can't do so until you have the permission. If that was the case, then we would never have needed Section 181. Okay. But Council, in order to, to follow a process, needs to know what it wishes to achieve and how it's going to achieve it. It can't just work with pie in the sky. There was mention of the, 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 19, uh, the 2012 agreement with the land. That 2012 agreement, yes, there was complications with it. There was a number of complications. Council then in 2014 chose to do something different. The issue is that this council is not that council. The people that are sitting around this table, some of them may be the same, but not all of them are the same. There was a difference in, in situation. They chose to actually follow a process. They've now determined, and this is a totally new process, it's got nothing to do with the old one. Yes, we've negotiated with the same land and of course we've ordered, and all the money we spent with regards to the board, we've been able to actually capitalise on so that nothing is wasted. Okay, with regards to the actual uh, ownership of that land and a, an agreement as the document stations were entered into with Tony Hayward in August. Okay, at the moment we busy finalising the final stages of that particular agreement uh, with the compensation to be paid out this week, the final payment of compensation. Compensation is specifically be registered until the Gazettal notice goes through because the whole process has been taken through the Gazettal and through the government process. So that, is, that explains what's actually happening there. With regards to the, 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 the agreements with the, the other landowners, until we actually have a proper agreement with a signed agreement with, with, with Albury Holdings, it's very difficult to get the other, other landowners to agree because we need to know what the route is through Albury in order to determine what the route is through their properties. So although we've got a, 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 an agreement in principle with most of the landowners, what we're waiting for is we're waiting for this final piece of the puzzle to fall into place, and that is to determine the route across this land. And as I said, it is what we need necessary. If we could take into consideration everything that Albany wishes to take into consideration, that would be first prize. But the problem is, as I stated right up front, the issue here is one of cost. The, 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 the risk of going down on, on the southern route, which is proposed, that is too difficult. I, I, I still think that that's not going to work. Um, because I, I cannot see us getting the environmental, the, the, the resource consent. And do we go through that process, agreeing something now, only to fall over with resource consent? I wouldn't suggest it to my mind, we can't go there. The northern route, the, my understanding is that the costs were between 490, 495 and 595,000. But that didn't take into consideration the added risk of if we need to increase pipe size or quality or, 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 that, or what that adds can add over the entire distance of that route. And that is where there is a huge risk. It's council's decision. I cannot make the decision for council. But that's something that we need to consider as a total cost. And we need to get that properly costed. 
The other issue that came up is that, um, well, we should have done all the engineering beforehand. Uh, we should have done all the ecology work. We, we were specifically excluded from Albury's farm from doing any of that work. There's a letter on file which actually states that. So for, for, for them to suddenly say, oh, no, you should have done this work beforehand, is, is a bit rich. You didn't, they didn't want to allow us, our people, to go onto the land to do the investigation to be able to make the proper determinations. And now they're throwing it in our face. That's really unacceptable. I'm happy to negotiate with them to, do, to, to try and find the best and easiest path through. But it, 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 it cannot just be one or two. That at the end of the day, it's council's decision. Council has the power. Council has the authority. Okay, council will decide what route it is. Okay. But you have the statutory authority to do so. And my understanding is that we've actually complied with the process to date. We've fully complied with that process from a legal perspective. I'm not in any here to actually address the other issues. Mm -hmm. Uh, there are a number of issues I'd, I'd like to address going, going through there. The first one was the engagement issue. Um, can we just chuck those slides back up? I need to refer to that. The first one is why, why we didn't um, engage prior to the technical of 2020. I, I think I should say that in a typical project, it's, it's about the level of detail that you have. So you go through a project, you tend to do some work, to feasibility work, to understand what you would like to do before you engage with landowners. Part of this is to um, mitigate unnecessary angst on landowners, because if you go and talk to someone right at the front saying, hey, we're going from here to here, we might come across and probably we might not. Um, you want to do a bit of work to at least get, your, get, your, get yourselves around that. We should say that the council resolution was from June. However, WSP was not engaged to start this work until October. I was not engaged, I think, until July of that year. So the council was going through a process of setting up to do that option and that feasibility for those to do that initial work so it could engage with landowners. What I um, pulled up here, this is a copy of the uh, draft land requirements plan that we uh, presented to Elbury on the 20th of May um, as part of our, our breakfast. What, what you can see here is there are a number of routes here. So to say in May that we had actually defined a route is not actually correct. We went there and said, this is what we're thinking, this is where we're going. We'd like to talk to you about these other options as well. We also took away from that meeting actions to do desktop exercises. And I say desktop because it's appropriate level of detail. Um, to look at those other routes to say, well, is this feasible, is this viable, is this value for money? And we assessed those routes, the northern boundary, the B and the C from Mr. Mark's submission. We said, look, they're over a kilometre longer. That's just not feasible from a cost point of view, let alone anything else. So the appropriate time to engage with the landowners after we've done a piece of work to, to agree with those options are. We, we did that work prior to engaging. There may be an argument here saying the history of this project, we should have gone earlier than that, but within a typical project, that is the process that you would follow. The next piece that I would like to address is the, the roofs that we're there. We talked about the orange roof and the red roof. Uh, and forgive me, I, I, we gave them different names in your submission and our submission, so I'm going to call them orange and red. That's okay. Yeah. Um, the orange roof, um, you see going straight through there, that was initially the first route that we went. They said, what's the shortest route through there? And yet it is two and a half, two point two thousand one hundred metres shorter than out in third. However, it is just not feasible. It goes straight through the middle of that tiger swamp, which we'd probably never get over the line, and, and sorry, forgive me, I'm going to go to another level of detail here. That's just to the left, so this is the tiger swamp here, and you can see that line going straight through property, no, no boundaries and stuff at this stage. So it, it, it was taken off the table very, very quickly because it, it's just not a feasible route. The second route that we looked at was this red route. Uh, as part of the motion report, they said, well, actually, let's go for a, a, a route to the west of the Tiger Swamp as well as to the north of it to see what that looks like. And you can see us, forgive me, I'm going to go between. 
This is that river route coming in here. It hits Sandals Road and goes south. We could have potentially joined into the orange route here, but we tried to avoid this building. So we took the, the decision to go onto the public road. And the idea is that you would stay on public roads wherever possible uh, because there is less cost from a property easement and better access from a maintenance point of view. You don't need to negotiate with landowners for access. So we're trying to minimize the amount of the entire pipeline on private access. We want to keep it on public as much as we can. Uh, so that was the decision behind that. That red route is around 500 meters shorter from that preferred route. However, when you bring in the additional property costs, so again, right, sorry, I'm going to bounce. Uh, these, the easy says, once you get off Sandhills Road, this is all in private land in here rather than public road, which is what this is. So we incur additional property easement cost on that section of the route, if that makes sense. And that, that comes out once we do the additional design costs and the property costs, that's close to cost neutral, even though there's a big saving in terms of 500 meters. The other point that I would like to address uh, is the impact on, on landowners. There are two parts here during construction and during maintenance. So once it's actually in operation. During construction, we, we talked about briefly in our original submission, we said it would be about five weeks in that whole area from the Henry boundary to Sandhills Road, three and a half of on Elbury themselves. We should also say that we have tried to minimize, so we put it below cultivation depth to minimize the impact on their farming operations. That's typically about 650. After discussions with Elbury in May, 20, May uh, 2020, we dropped that down to 750. And actually, most of the pipeline since then, we've dropped below the meter to minimize that impact on their farming operations. In terms of actually going in and maintaining that pipeline route is 50 years is the asset life. So once it's in the ground, it's in the ground, it's minimal. We'll go back and we will inspect it, say, once a year, and that would be mainly walking the route, having a look at it. You could drive the route. However, after discussions in May with L route, we've instructed and we checked with our maintainer, and they would be happy to walk that piece of route. There's no, it takes longer, it costs a little bit more because you're not driving it, but they're happy to get into their operating procedures. And what you're doing is you're just walking that route, looking to see if anything might need an intervention. But you'd also be looking at the valves. So there are some valves in there and you may need to get a change them within that 50 years. So the, the actual valves uh, have a, a shorter life. However, we're not talking about going in with a digger or ripping things up. We're talking about taking a manhole off, um, going in, changing some bits, and then going in. You might want to get a truck in there using the access ways just to bring things in. So the actual impact on the landowner is minimal although there would be some direct during construction of which they would be compensated for. Um, other things, we had a quick look at the design drawings and we verified the area that would be thrusted. So uh, LB Hobbings and their submissions here would be about 700 meters. We went and measured the design. It's 270 from the, uh, the bit that would be drilled from Mr. Breaton's underneath the airstrip. So about 300 meters. So we're confident assessment of that. The other thing to address is a shelter belt, uh, some different information, so 2.5 versus 5 metres. Um, it might just be a misunderstanding there. We said 5 metres from shelter belt, so 5 metres from the centre of the tree, so the trunk is where we'd like to be. Our initial communication was 2.5 metres from the edge of the tree, so from the drip line. So if you think about it, it's essentially the same distance. It's just one measured from the trunk, one measured from the drip line of the tree. And you miscommunicated that, I think, by using two different ways to measure it. So the distance has not really changed. Um, the, the only other point was just to reiterate my, my colleague, Mr. Swan, who's point about the lack of access that we have been on the 20th of May into October, the invitation to go and walk the routes and have a look. However, outside of that time, access has been refused to us despite repeated requests. Uh, and, and so we have done 
design uh, based on desktop, live and art to the best of our ability and putting models in there to do that and take any appropriate actions from uh, the yes, uh, caveat that we have not had access for geotechnical service. Um, I think that is all the ones that we discussed for address. I may have missed a couple of them, there are quite a few from your submissions. I think those are the second ones we picked up when I was taking notes as you were speaking. Thank you. Do you like to comment on that? I would. Um, I have to say that um, I don't accept um, Mr. Stonopol's interpretation of Schedule 12 of, the local, of Section 181 of the local government. The first requirement of that schedule is that a description of the works accompanied by a plan must be deposited for public inspection at a place in the district in which the works be undertaken. There is no evidence before this um, council meeting that that was done. And that is the first and the primary obligation because these are works being undertaken in the local district. Public notification is essential. You haven't done it. So we're at a, at a meeting now where the public have not been notified in advance. <coughs> Elbury have been notified, and that's the second obligation. So there's there's a there's a there's two obligations. One to notify the public, and secondly to notify Elbury, and Elbury were notified and they've objected and they are now in this hearing. But I must say I'm surprised that all of the other affected landowners aren't also included in that notification process. So I, I take the point that um, there's some doubt as to how they're going to be affected until the, the crossing of the Elbury um, farmland is removed. But I would have thought that if you're intending to carry out works on another landowner's property pursuant to this plan, this, um, pro this plan then they should have been notified as well. Um, So, oh, sorry, just to finalise that, I think Mr. Swanepoel said that it was his understanding that, there had, that a copy of the works had been left at Tiahu Centre. That's not my understanding. Nobody I know has had any, has seen this document at Tiahu Centre. Um, and I think that's a fatal <coughs> failing in this process and the councillors are obliged to dismiss the application on that basis. The only thing I can add in, in regard to the, um, I guess you could call it the negativity of us spending extra time meeting with the council, etc., on these proposed work or sites was I did say very clearly until they had um, confirmed that they had the ownership of the land that we didn't want to waste any more time because we have been taken through this route with the FNDC back in 2010-2012 with assurances and even have letters here from the council saying they actually own the land. But in actual fact, you still don't own the land today. It still has to be finalised. And the concern for me there is, yes, you may have an agreement that was finally um, agreed to in October and you um, have paid a deposit, but right now you do not have the land ownership and you are spending ratepayers' money on all of this work, knowing that this land may be yours, maybe next week, maybe next year. But most people in the community would be very cautious about spending ratepayers' money on projects like this, because it obviously hasn't been urgent because there's been nothing happening from 2012 until this year, that um, that risk has been taken by the council. Because most public people would not invest pe other people's money in something until you fully owned it. Thank you. Okay. I'm just now going to hand the floor to Mr. Finch. And then we'll go to elected members for questions. 
Thank you, through the Chair. I just want to have one additional item that you raised in your submission regarding Council approval. Um, there was a Council resolution in DX uh, um, in August that gave full authority to start to progress this project, uh, including land acquisition uh, contract negotiations and contract award. It was considered in PX and therefore public, uh, sorry, public, publicly excluded, which means uh, because of the commercial sensitivity of uh, budgets and other uh, commercial issues uh, considered by elected members at that time,
This is the valuation that we got from Chris Palmer on the 30th of June, based on values he's got from somewhere, of market values, says that the total loss of grazing for one year is $850. The um, actual cost um, for the easement is 20700 and, and I think the King say that the valuations that those figures are calculated on are, are miles off, but they're not remotely accurate. No, the question is for the King, and, and they don't need to answer the exact figures. Have they done a, a costing of the total impact to the farm uh, in the short term? No, uh, so. Fences broken and so on. And the short repair and also long term in terms of operation of the farm. I don't think they've got to that stage yet. No. No. In, in the short term, it, it's the concern about the across the year. There's a concern with. Um, well, I want to be convinced that how they're going to put the pipeline through the peak is going to be no impact on us in a year's time. They'll be gone. They've got their money and dug it off. I'm left with a problem. And that's when the pipe could be affected by the farmer. Because they'll be gone. They don't give a shit. Yeah, I'm, I'm more interested in doing the costings. Um, no, I, I, I don't know why we should even bother doing the costings. It's their project. No, 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 that's, uh, I'm not challenging you about the costings. I'm just wanting to know if that's been done. No, it's not. So, but no, no, it's not. So can I just have a quick two minutes? Can I just explore that one point further? I will give you more time. You've given us an assurance that taking the pipeline through the peak swamp will not have an impact on... Elderly holdings. Mr. King is saying, What happens if you're wrong? You've got your money and you bug it off, quote unquote. Um, so, what is the process if it is wrong and there is an impact on the farm and that's discovered in 12 months, 18 months, two years from now? What's the process? Can someone talk us through that? I'll bring the best to deal with that. Is generally speaking, what will actually happen then is that the, there is a warranty, and you've been given with regards to that, that the, you've got two warranties in that in this particular instance. One is from the design, from the designers who just have the ASP, and they cover it with insurance, and they'll have insurance, so they'll actually have to put a claim on the insurance, and then they will actually have to get constructed in to come and redo the work. That is the, 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 the situation over there. And we'd be seeking, the council would be seeking to recover the cost from both the supplier and from the people who actually constructed the pipe at the time. And if that means that they've lost grazing for another year, you're affection again at that stage? Yes, I'm entitled to recover their damages and their losses as well. Thank you. Mr. Kusich? Yeah, just a just point of clarity, Mr. Sort of George, uh, point of clarity. Uh, are, we, are we going for an easement? Do we need an easement? I, we need the, 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 the reality of the situation is no, you don't need an easement, okay, because the act allows you to actually construct the work. But in, in what we would be doing is we would be seeking an easement in some state public works act as well to actually give certainty to everybody as to where the pipe is and to be able to actually have access yep, so that's, 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 that's um, not just a personal right, but a real yep, right. I understand that. So all, all I want is clarity, because you're quoting two different parts of the act, which is quite obviously confuses me, and I'm not a lawyer. So you you are saying you want to go to the Public Works Act, and therefore the process is shift Public Works well, Act. Well, maybe what you do is you agree with all that. You, you agree with all that. Uh, the process is normally one. You actually set the route that you want to go. Then the next two is you actually agree access. So you can actually construct the, 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 the pipe. Then what you do is you do what's called as-built drawings, and the as-built drawings then actually create what is actually going to be an easement. So if I talk you through the process that we've done the smoothie road, uh, that is exactly the process we followed. We, we started off, we first went and saw the, 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 the lander and asked for permission to actually do a bore. He, he agreed to the bore, and we actually did all our tests on that on that particular site. We then needed to actually do a pipeline to join us. We then we 
and, 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 and drafted a, 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 a pipeline on it. We had a chat to him about the particular pipeline, and that was the, the route that was he didn't quite want to take. He moved that pipeline slightly. We agreed to, to move it, but he gave us access to construct the pipeline. We then constructed the pipeline there. The next step then is to actually agree to the, the, the um, easement over that particular pipeline. We then agreed an easement over that pipeline, and those documents have just been signed now. We also had to create an easement in this particular instance for Drop Energy uh, to supply power to the pumps and that. And that was a, a totally different uh, negotiation. The council stepped in and actually assisted with that. Quick, just give me a simple. Uh, you desired the easement, correct? Preferably by agreement, correct? Claiming that you were saying it's. Claiming that you, you don't have to give an easement. But you can do so as a public business. But if you're going to have an easement, first of all, it's going to be surveyed. You know, Correct. So you've got to survey the route, then you've got to register the easement on the on the type against the titles. In this instance, if you can't get agreement on an easement, then you have to go under the Public Works Act and it's more compensation payable for the easement. There's always going to be be compensation payable for the easement. Can I just add, you're going to have to have an easement if you want to go onto the property to check the pipe. Maintain it. No, you don't. Maintain it. You must do. No, you don't, because you've got section 182 of the Act, which actually gives you the, which creates a situation where you can actually enter into the property for inspection of works. Wow. Good luck. Yeah, you see why it's confusing. Confusing, I'm sure it's confusing. Yeah, yeah, no. So the Act. Uh, we talked about the deck to cover that off. 
Uh, use of farm machinery, the pipe valves and batter caps when cultivating, doing hay or silage. Valve chambers are constructed to be flush with the existing ground level. Positions will be agreed with you prior to installation so as to minimise any impact on farming operations. Servicing of the pipes and inspections. Process to notify owners of people of farm um, health and safety, sign in, etc. Uh, yes, that was a, an important part, point that was raised by the owners, and we um, have uh, adopted further wording in the uh, agreement, easement agreement, to allow for health and safety, and that was uh, sent back to the owners to review and their lawyer.
as, as a point for a council in the statute, the easements are generally an approach for private situations. So when the previous landowner um, who, who started the Sweetwater Board decided that he wished to actually do a pipeline through to Kaitaia, he needed to create an easement over everybody's property because he was a private owner, he was not a, he was not a council. He needed to actually have that private agreement with each one of the landowners to, to be able to get his water through to the, to, to the treatment lot or wherever he was going to take it. Um, if I need, if I do a subdivision, I may need to create a right-of-way easement over a neighbour's property. But in order to be able to cross over that property, we need to actually reach that agreement. Uh, we need to the local authority. The local authority has certain powers in terms of the acts that, that govern it, which actually gives it certain power to do certain things in in the overland uh, without necessarily the consent, and then sets out the process to deal with it. That is what we are dealing with here in terms of Section 181 where they've set out a process that you can actually construct these pipelines reticulation system over private land, but you don't need to actually have an easement over the private land. They give you the right to construct it, and then they give you the right to repair, inspect, and to continue repairing and maintaining it. Um, so that's what it does. However, you do not, uh, the, the, the preference, the remaining preference remains to actually have an easement because it actually gives you a record for the future. And sometimes council records aren't the, the flashes, particularly when it comes to pipelines and that, to actually be able to look at it. Whereas a survey pipeline would be a, a better route to go. And that's why the recommendation from the staff has always been for an easement. Could I just add to that? Because the reason why the council would want an easement is that it's registered on the title. So if Elbury sells the land to somebody else, the person buying that land has got reached, they've got notification that there is an easement over the property. So it's 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 publication to everybody that might have any interest in that land. So I can't it just seems extraordinary that you would want to put this pipeline in and not take an easement. You would want an easement to protect your interests and protect your access. Thank you. I just, just wonder if I could ask George, um, just for my clarity, as a, as a humble lady, I don't understand the, the legal side. George? Thank you, sir. Just um, a question for, for you. So, just for my understanding, and Councillor Vucic was suggesting there could be some delay, but my understanding is under the Local Government Act, we have the right to um, install the pipeline um, subject to council approval and any other legal process that follows, so, 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 that, follows that um, without a easement having been finalised. So the reason the easement would be great to have, but it would not delay the works to yeah. put the pipeline in. So, so if, with, with, with regards to what would normally happen now, particularly with modern technology, the pipeline would be registered on the GIS system, and the GIS system falls part of the limb information so that the new owner who purchased it would actually be able to see the pipeline on the GIS map system, okay, if there wasn't an easement. The easement is just that added layer of security over that. With regards to your... your, your uh, With what George has just spoke about raises probably hair on my back, because basically what he's saying is, I don't know why we're here today, except for you to hear this, because it's actually saying council can go and do whatever they want to do on anyone else's land if they choose to follow this path. The easement agreement is what I believed was where the two parties can agree on conditions of the easement so that both parties are protected. What he's saying is, basically, we are giving our farm to the FNDC to come and go as they wish. They don't have to do anything with us, ask us nothing. If we happen to be out there shooting rabbits or whatever else and somebody comes in, who's responsible? It's not us. But I'm saying to you, what I've heard more from George now makes me very, very wary about where FNDC is going. And I think it's very important for the rest of the public to have known and listened to what has been put forward here today in this regard, if it is legally allowed. And Council will take that um, step to back all of that 
Um, yeah. I think what we're hearing today thing. is a more principled debate about the, ver the merits of an easement versus no easement in general uh, for the committee's education. I can't speak for my colleagues, but I can't think of a single reason why you would not have an easement. Uh, from my perspective, council records get lost, memories fade, and 100 years from now your land might be rezoned residential. Who knows? Without an easement agreement there that clearly identifies yep. what is under the ground, um, I think it's more of a principal debate at this point. Okay, so I wouldn't be too concerned about it. And I and I shouldn't be putting words in my colleagues' mouths. They may have a completely different opinion. But um, we'll just keep going. Mr. Collar, are you? You're done? Yeah. Mr. Rana. Yeah. Thank you, Anne. Anne, I may be incorrect here. Um, you mentioned that to get a pipeline across um, Fiona and Joe's land would be a compensation would be around 58,000, is that correct? Um, I, I believe so. I would like the opportunity to check that number, if that's all right. It was not all right. Um, but I, I believe it's that I'm considering from memory that might have been the entire number from Hayward to Sandwich Road, so Mr. Brereton's and Mr. Holmes and Mr. Panthers as well. So if you will give me that opportunity to confirm what our, our assumptions are. Do you have a yeah, yeah, I don't think it's that sort of sum. That's the only one that was only around $20,000. The desktop was only the desktop. All right, so... Uh, so it would be all defended by uh, registered title holders. Okay. Yeah. 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 Yeah
We, in, we, we, that's a day, that's a, a legal ownership in, in, in the true sense. However, we actually have all the access and everything that we need, which is the fact that we actually can do what we want on the piece of land, which is what we're already doing. Mr. Clinton. Thank you. Um, a few comments, I guess. Uh, the, um, I think we can all agree that it's a shame this wasn't resolved eight, nine years ago, but it wasn't. And that's clear that a lot of the mistrust and frustration and annoyance is a legacy of that um, work that was done or not done, and we can all regret that and wish it had been different. But to mm -hmm. get that, I think what we need to all keep in mind collectively is that Kaitai needs water. So we need to find a solution to a very real problem. The town nearly ran out last year, and it's a very good possibility that we're going to have similar challenges this year. So all of our deliberations and thinking, I think, has to be informed by that very stark reality that we need to secure a long-term reliable water supply. Um, in terms of questions, there are issues around the costings, which, like Councillor Vucic, I'll more appropriate deliberation just to work the toss around those numbers to get clarity. I do accept the point made that um, it's difficult to know what level of detail one ought to go into when establishing options. Do you invest a huge amount of money in each of those various options, knowing that a lot of that cost actually will be sunk and also lost if you, uh, when you finally come to agree on where you are going to go? Um, I am curious about the apparent dispute about the status of that access road. Is it paper road or is it private access with some sort of a gentle species agreement? And again, something we can get better informed how we can get a response to. Um, more generally, the status of the agreements with the other affected landowners, whether they are signed and delivered or are they still at the handshake level, uh, because all of this obviously will assist our, our decision making as well. Um, yeah, there seems to be some dispute about access to the land in order to better inform the um, developing the options, whether it was denied, whether we failed to ask, and again, that's something we can perhaps um, unpick, but it's, well, I guess it's historic now, but um, yeah, having a level of confidence that those options are well costed and well determined is something we'll need to be really concerned. We'll need to be reassured about. And then again, this whole question of easements, which I thought I had a clear handle on, but like others, I suspect I don't. Mr. Mark's comments in his section 32 about the normal process to determine the pipeline route, obtain easements, and equalise those easements. That, to my mind, is effectively the, the logical sequence of events that Council had determined. Um, in 34, you suggest the discussing the routes with affected landowners in advance of that would have been the right way forward. And again, um, practically and logically, that is what one would do. And it does seem there has been a level of that because the debate, the conversations have been ongoing. So we do need, as I say, as when you make that decision, just to have absolute clarity about um, where those two processes do in reality conflict, and to what extent, in fact, did they conflict? Yeah, I think everything else will really be, either has been answered already, or something that's probably a level of detail we don't need to at this point. But just one particular point, that's paper road issue or not? But, yes. Yeah, so the, the, sorry, so the, the paper road issue, in, as part of the resource consent, there was there in one of the paragraphs referring to the paper road rather than the paper road. Um, it affected potentially Mr Hayward and Mr Panther. And we have since been back to both of them, raised it with both of them, indicated that there is no impact as part of the conditions and offered to redress that with the regional council if required, and both of them have not taken a of that option. So as soon as it was raised by Elbury Holdings, we looked at it with no hands up, we, that shouldn't say paper road, it should say private road. Um, the issue with that is, sorry, I'm going into more detail now, potentially in general, if it's a paper road, one of the conditions of the consent would be that you would um, uh, naturalise it afterwards and it would become a natural private road. That's not as part of any of the conditions. And so there is actually no material impact. There's nothing in the conditions. It's just 
had an error in a report that was passed in the Senate application that went there. And again, we, we've given one for the most Mr. Hayward and Mr. Panther, who are, who are potentially impacted, but we believe not impacted, but we will address that if we need to. And we will either party to take this up. Can I just clarify that? The, it's an excess lot, not any road. The excess lot is attached to Mr. Bird, uh, Mr. Panther's property and Mr. Hayward's property. It doesn't have its own title at all. Yeah. And just on a broader question, Pastor George, the status of those agreements with other landowners, are we entirely confident that there's not going to be other objections raised at this point? The issue we have in this area with Mr. Brayton and Mr. Panther is we can't finalise those until we get to uh, agreement with Calgary Holdings. We were, uh, Mr. Panther would have potentially two routes, um, so from his property going north, his property going south, if you will, um, and we don't believe either of those would be an option. Mr. Brayton's has always been the same, but with that route on the northern boundary um, coming back into uh, Suggestion from the email, I think it's the 23rd of November from the Elder Codding. That changes things substantially for Mr. Britton. We've had no engagement with him um, as, as part of that process. We thought we'd have the hearing today um, because it, it, it was in, in part. So we, we've not actually assessed that route. When we looked at it, we went from a cost perspective and, and other perspectives, it's not feasible to council. So there is little benefit in bringing that up and assessing whether it would be amenable to Mr. Britton. We captured that as a risk if we did choose to want to go to the time. I can fill you in on regard to the others. That not one of the other um, applicants like ourselves agreed to the valuations that have been sent to us as yet. So that's an ongoing negotiation with the other landowners as well. Okay. Through you, Madam Chair, um, just, just as a point of clarification, could um, Elbury Holding just to advise whether or not they've had any, any discussion with Mr. Bruce and if they went to Northern Good. Yes, we have. We were happy to meet um, with the council staff last week, um, but he's away. He would have been here today, but he's away in Waikara Moana. I probably should have apologised that the Fosters would have been here with us today is to hear this process, um, to see how it works, um, but they didn't, weren't notified either. And we were unsure whether we were able to bring any public members with us or not. Just a matter of hold on there. I just want to pull schedule 12 1 2 ED 1 1 ED. The Territorial Authority must hold a meeting on the day appointed and may, after hearing any person making any objection, determine to proceed with the work of the <coughs> With or without any alterations of the territorial authority thinks fit. My question for you is that how are the council supposed to arrive at a position when we have a number of options on for us on the table that haven't been discussed with the adjoining landowner and there's no supporting information? So the, well, the, the route that has been discussed with the adjoining landowners and what they were waiting for is the proposed route, which is the route. Everybody is aware, however, that there is alternate routes and that we can ride on this. So once we agree, once we can get the, the, the missing piece, which is Albury Holdings, into, on, into an agreement as to what the route is, leaving the other issue as to compensation, because compensation, as I said, can be determined in different ways. Um, and it is a process, it is an evaluation tribunal, so you use the, the process set out in the Public Works Act if you can't commission an agreement. I hear you, Mrs. Swanpool. I'm going to interrupt you, Mrs. Swanpool, so I haven't met yet. Yep. And the map identifies this blue group. Can you put that map? This was option B on Albury Holdings. I'm just hearing now that Mr. Ber Berishan is an affected party, and, and I, I have no comfort that he's aware of that alternate proposal, or that we've had any discussions with him on that alternate proposal. So all the I don't want to hear about the law. Mm -hmm. I want to hear about whether or not we have engaged with the land. 
Before you move to be engaged with, the, with, with, with Mr. Brayton, his I understand is the blue route. Uh, I can probably jump in here. Um, we have only uh, pushed the blue route option, uh, sorry, the dark blue option there. Uh, and um, in my um, negotiation with Mr. Brayton, he wasn't happy with any alternate route. Uh, yes. I can't speak for Mr. Brayton, but that was just the, the, the discussions I had with him. He was happy with the proposed blue route. But Can we talk about purple and blue? Because otherwise it gets a bit confusing. I might be a bit colourblind. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the dark blue? Yeah. The dark blue? Yeah. So that's the route that Mr. Brayton um, has been negotiated with and uh, is um, relatively happy with. Um, he did indicate in that conversation that he wouldn't be happy with any alternative routes. But when was that? That what was uh, way back when I first met with him. Uh, back in of this hearing has been challenged. I would really appreciate confirmation that we've complied with Schedule 12 of the Local Government Act, uh, 1A, as well as the requirement for public notification. So whether I can get that clarification now or whether that needs to be made today is fine. The only other question I had was in regards to, uh, Mr Halea, your recount of the chronology, uh, chronology of the negotiations. Is it... It states in here that the first engagement was in April of this year. Uh, so there was no prior site visit or engagement between uh, yourselves and any other landowners prior to April of this year. Is that correct? Uh, yes, I believe, I believe so. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Councillor Mr. Sorry, Councillor, we've been talking to Mr. Hayden prior to that about land purchase, but um, nothing else will be Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Yep. Um, hang on. Thank you. Sorry, everybody, I'm not there. I've got germs. Um, just thank you, Councillor Clendon, for covering most of what I was going to say. And just um, for whoever can answer this, the 2011 route, easement and compensation... How do they vary to what the situation, you know, what the route, um, uh, access rights and compensation are proposed today? I'm not sure if the Kings will answer that or um, George. I can address that. The, the, Thank you. The original, the original agreement did provide for access across Elbury's paddocks. Uh, but there were some significant advantages to Albury from that agreement. And in particular, because Albury's got two pieces of land, that agreement with Mr Haywood provided, and the other landowners provided for access from one of the properties to the other property. And so it made a lot of sense to um, Albury at the time to allow for the pipeline to cross its paddocks but since that time, they've developed this proposal to, in the last three years, I think, to um, plant that paddock with avocados. So if the Sweetwater pro project had gone ahead, that probably would have resulted in the avocado operation not going ahead. But when it was scotched, they decided, to, because it's avocado land, they decided to plant it with avocados. Does that answer your question, Mr. And um, just around the compensation, is it much different today than it was back in 2011? A lot different because um, the, the acquisition of land from Mr Breaton to our ownership, there was that value. There was also the value of this easement access lot 
um, that we were going to be able to have a right of way over it. So it was a lot of acquisition of land in order to do it. Uh, when council um, withdrew from the water project back in 2012-13, um, it was left stagnant. Um, and three years ago, we applied to the regional council for this water process, and we are in the group of one of 27 um, with the regional council here, and we've had the hearing um, two or three months ago, so we're waiting for the outcome of um, the water um, applications that would then allow us to um, form the avocado orchard itself. Okay, thank you. And um, a big difference. basically, we're saying it's a huge difference from two thousand from then to now. Awesome, awesome. Um, under the discussion that was had between the two lawyers regarding Section 181 of the Local Government Act, water care um, were in court, I think it was, two years ago. So there is some case law around um, the use of Section 181 and any land that is... Um, had any council or ter you know territorial authority um, infrastructure put in now has to be listed on LIMS as a section 181, just so that everybody knows that. And that thank I you. don't have any other questions. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Stratford. Um, yeah. When we talked about the Adam Carter uh, as an option early in September, we agreed to align with the future parcels um, to, to minimise the impact on the I, I haven't seen the output of the work and we haven't had the time to, to, to see what the impact was. And there were discussions about north and south and 12 degrees west and north about which one that would be. And we were willing to, to, to work with them in terms of that. So I, I just want to hear <coughs> with Charlie and Fiona because I'd like to get an understanding about your farm and your aspirations, if that's all right. I want to start off by thanking you very much for making um, your farm available for uh, a site visit in October, which I took up. And I teamed up with Councillor Apollo and Councillor Radic and the staff and they talk about the winter listeners, but there was nothing tropical about that day. We got very wet and very cold and we walked all over the farm. So thank you for that. What I struggle with with these maps is they're not topographical maps, so you can't actually tell that over here by the lake and up towards Tony Hayes, it's quite steep. And it presents some challenges. And when we were there, we were very fortunate to be able to be taken into an old gum digger's cave. And I really enjoyed that opportunity. I really worry about the red line. I've got to say, I really worry about that one because I think we're going to run into a whole bunch of archaeological challenges. We're going to run into sites of significance. Tomorrow we're going to run into problems with our proximity to the water. Um, you might like to talk me through your thinking about that red line. We, we walk the route of the dark blue line and your concerns at that time, as you expressed them to me, Joe, were around drainage, predominantly drainage. And then we walk the route of the green line and you were quite favourable to the green line at that time um, and I realised that we were pending the outcome of the water consent hearing and we were pending the outcome of the conversation about whether the avocados aligned through north or 12 degrees either side of north. And something's changed in the interim and I haven't quite grasped what's changed in the interim um, that those options are now off the table. So I guess if I if we just have a clear look at what your future aspirations um, are and, and what's driving your concerns, I think that would be really helpful for me. 
I, for one, is whatever we do or whatever the next owners do with the farm, if it's down the boundary, you know, you can't build a house within how many metres? 10. 10 metres of the boundary, okay? You know what I mean? What I'm saying? It, the impact is far less if the pipeline is three metres from the boundary, wherever that is. Um, and the other one with the avocados is, one is we've got to get the water, otherwise there's going to be no avocados, and that's up in the air at the moment. Um, and we had a, a, a preliminary survey of that green line, and it is a pro it's pretty right, it's pretty correct, the green line. It'd be straight. Um, and the red line is not correct anyway. It's, it's more or less a, um, a straight line from the ball, straight down the boundary. It's, it's dead straight. Once it gets to here, I don't know what's here, but I know land court grazed their deer accounts here. They, they look off. So twice a day, every day, they walk back to the cow shed, which is on Sandals Road. And it, they, it definitely would not affect the tiger swamp, the wetland. Now, I, I don't know why you go that way. You could come straight through. Or, I don't know. Or I don't walk that. It's not our land. The, the red line is following the lake. It's not actually following our boundary. And if you followed our boundary, it's within the green grass area. It's a, there was a paper road around the lake that was taken through a gazette notice that went to dock that's now fenced up. And our property is... Um, at least 20 metres. At least 20 metres. So when we talk about all these resource consents, which I'm yet to find out through a planning assessment from a registered planner, um, what clauses that we are discussing, um, I don't think that it can be ruled out on assumptions. Especially when it's two kilometres shorter. I, I just uh, just that's not the two kilometres one. The two kilometres one went straight through the tiger swamp. It's it's what's that? The two kilometre one goes straight through. The oh, okay. Well, it's not much of a deviation. It's five hundred metres. But, but there is some well, issue. I'm with that. Put money on that. There is some we'll issue. A, a bit on it. <laughs> Why council does not want to deal with the iwis and their land because. Nga Takato and Tirara own most of the land taken from Langford through to Burnett's Road. And no one will answer our questions as Mr. Hillier says, um, sorry, Mr. Palmer says, we ask questions, and that's been one of the questions each time, and no one will answer it. Why do they not want to negotiate with Nga Takato or Tirara? And it's the straightest route, and they own most of the land under general title. Can I ask you about the pale or the, the light blue line? My concern, before you heard me get quite staunch with Mr. Swanepoel, and I apologise for that, Mr. Swanepoel, but the blue line is that entirely within your boundary? No. no. Um, that was a meeting that we had asked for last Wednesday and that we wanted you and one of the councillors to come with us from Walker. But unfortunately no councillors could come and it was only Mr Hilliard and um, WPS that um, said they could come. And we would have met Mr the there at the same time. Um, and without minimising your concerns, because they are totally valid, my concern is about the constantly shifting goalposts. So we had a line that was agreed with Mr Hayward, and you times moved on and you've developed plans to, to, to put avocados in, and I understand that. And when we met on site, that line was agreeable to you, subject to working with your avocado specialist and determining where the trees get planted, and, and that's now off the table. And now we've got another option, so I'm just, I'm just 
worried that we will still be here in 12 months still having conversations about where the line goes and bringing in yet more land items. Um, what we need to say, Ed, is that blue line and the one that went to Kunasich Road has been there since day one, but it was chosen to be not acceptable and it kept coming back to the blue line, the blue line, the blue line. Every conversation that we had to have with people whereby we asked, well, what about considering the old line? But because it was the proposed avocado thing and we did get someone in to plan it and if there's nothing we could do in regard to getting it surveyed, etc., because our silage has only come off yesterday, which you saw that grass growing, mm -hmm. it only came off yesterday. But then with Mr with George's letters, et cetera, to us in regard to the blue line and Mr. Brereton's driveway having to be five metres from trees and with the pipeline. And so when you have an avocado orchard and you have a row of trees here and a row of trees here, that says five metres, five metres plus the, plus the easement. And I, we just thought, that's bigger than the county road that's coming into our property now. We're not going to have a 10 metre road through our place. So that went off, the, went off the table because everything started changing and getting ridiculous to what comments were being made to us. I have a question for Mr Palmer around the compensation. Can I get there? Can I, uh, so can I just have clarity about that light blue line? Just the thing that I have to clear As it stands there, that light blue line running what, which is roughly north to south, is that the, roughly on the boundary between Bread and property and Old Bird Holdings? It Which is, side of the boundary is it? No, it, is, it is follows the FEDC county district drain that already has bylaws from this council to ensure that no buildings, no trees. Yeah, but sorry, access. but who's got title to that? Whose land does it cross? Or it, it's Breatons and ourselves. But it it's is the same, boundary. It's the same with everything in the drainage district up there. Every every landowner has to give that access because it is a bylaw of this council. Mm -hmm. Are you just going to walk us through it, are you, Mr. Okay, this council, this, this from the north to approximately here is on Breatons. Yeah. Um, this is Albert Holmes. Okay. Yeah, it's a bit unclear on the slide I have, it's just the legal ground mm. yeah. And the line across the top of the map? Oh, so, it's quite, so this is now really down to there, yeah, to, to that, and that for three And we have not had a conversation with Mr. Gresham about this? No, we haven't. We haven't um, but, but Mr. and Mrs. King say that the Bradens have agreed to that alignment. Yeah, the meeting that Rick Palmer um, tried to get organised last Wednesday or Thursday with a councillor or two um, was not acceptable due to other things, and that's when Mr. Brereton and ourselves would have been together. Um, but he's agreed to it. But, but he, he agreed to it in principle until we go and look at it properly. But my concern about all of this is this was put up right at the start as a route, even the route straight out to Kunisich Road, which the paperwork clearly says they'd like to stick to county roads, um, and we're coming back to them now because they were discounted before. Okay, so I can be clear Thanks. on my mind. Everyone's going to be my so everybody can see from here, the camera's up there. Anybody watching online can see better from here. Can you please point out on this map the board on Tony Yep, so this, this is the uh, actual one, which yeah. is the one that went in around 2010. And roughly about here is production one two. Okay. Now, this piece of land through here to the end of Bird Road is. <coughs> and then this blue line is talking about going down Bird Road. Yep, so there's a small section here from, say, this point here to here, which is the half share by Mr. Hayley and Mr. Panther. Yep. It's then public road up to the corner here, uh, where we hit Elbury Holdings to approximately here, where it comes Mr. Breton's. And Mr. Breton's. All the way to this one here, where it comes over the holdings again, yeah. and then the other holdings back down to the middle road. And that is, can you just explain the drainage again, please, Ms. Kate? She's a 
chairman of the drainage committee. Yeah, can, would you, if you can stand at the main point of it helps. The drain is the main drain district drain that drains all of Langford Farm. There's two main drains. So this drain is, is comes through Langford here. The water follows out here, carries on through, and then carries on down to the Waipak Cut. So this from here to here is a county drain. It's about five, six metres wide. How far wide? And on the, on, on the east side, is, this is Brenton's house here. He has his driveway in here, down here, and then across to his house, or there, to his house. So all of that there is a form of road, which is their driveway. Because it is a county drain, it has to have dry, um, gates that which the machines go through to clean the drains. So all of this through here is already a full road with gates that open um, for machinery to go through. That's why we were suggesting that that was a very clean, easy way of getting through. Um, I have spoken to Mr. Brereton on the telephone in regard to it, um, and but he's away for today. But he he would have happy to walk that track with people out of there. It's this line through here, which would be through his paddocks and our paddocks. There's, this is all sand country. Is that sand, John? This is like that goes up onto sand. But that's why we're asking from a perspective of not affecting anyone, getting on with the job. That's, that's the most suitable provider for both landowners. Could I ask Mr Halea what your concerns would be other than cost and the fact that we don't necessarily have all the landowner agreements in place to further investigation of that work? So there are a, a number of options. It, it, it is predominantly a, a cost argument because it is a significant number. Um, <coughs> So we don't see it as a big risk, but when you when you look at the NRC website, there is a small wetland here that it would go through, so we have to do some more ecological work on that. I think it's linked to the one that we've already done the assessment with on Mr. Hayward's property. Um, and I'm conscious that we've had conversations before that are not got wetland, but that's what they've shown. There are some other concerns about it being a flooding area, but other parts of the pipeline are so we're really not to be bothered about that one either. But it's mainly the function of uh, pipe class, pipe, pipe size, which then converts into cost, which is the argument. The problem with pipe class as well is because it's our standard off the shelf project, we, we get a two month delay because they need to start manufacturing it, which will impact us. But um, it, it, it's predominantly down to a cost group, so it's it's more engineering, more material, more labour to put in. I have a question about injurious infection, so I'm going to come back to that. While we're on the on the conversation of the pipeline route and cost, I just want to go back to the floor because you may have some more questions. I'm start with Mr. Finch. So, honey, I just wanted to give us a comment that if we went to the light blue route, what the impact would be upon project delivery and drought resilience for Koto. Uh, so there would be a delivery uh, delay for some reasons on the cost. Um, it would take longer. I haven't done the maths behind it, but there would be a chance that we may not be able to get it in place for next summer. Uh, I can't confirm that right now, but with the delay for the manufacturing costs, um, and the additional time we need to take, I cannot guarantee at this point in time whether we could get it in place for next summer. Um, I'm not saying we can't on record, but we need to have a look at that and it will be close.
I had one other question on the far corner where the pool was, but that was answered. Um, by Fiona um, or somebody. So really, I I struggled to see. That's what I said about earlier before. Like the, the inherent risk with a number of issues being raised and, and the delays seemed to me to outweigh the option of this route. Thank you. Are there any other questions from my colleagues on this matter? Okay. Okay. In, in terms of the, the, the legal people, the potential delays in terms of uh, court action, should whatever decision is made here today or tomorrow, whenever it is, what are the potential delays in terms of that court action? Okay, so the first thing is piece of string. So the that long. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the reality is, is actually it's, it's not quite that long because they have to first day they have to file the statements of uh, objection to the district court within 14 days. And that's what the act provides for. Thereafter, it will be for the registrar to determine. And when I spoke to Paul Lincoln, um, the uh, district court registrar in Wangarei, his advice to me was that, that it would depend how long the hearing would take. Uh, it would then depend on, we, you could probably fit it in on the next civil list today, that, once all the papers are in, uh, if it depended, if it was just a two or three hour hearing. But it's not going to be, I mean, this is going to be days of hearing. Why? Well, it has to be. I mean, well, you're, going to, you're going to have to go through the whole decision making process again. It's not going to be done in two to three hours. And I, I would be highly surprised if you would get a hearing in the first quarter of next year. I mean, they're not even allocating fixtures now for the first quarter of next year. They're looking at the second quarter at the earliest, and if you have anything more than, you know, a, a very brief hearing, um, it's, it, you could well be into the middle of the year. Yeah. And it's going to take time. I mean, you can't. Look, we've taken... How long have we taken? OK, so the, the issue here is, is what's going to be on appeal is council decision. OK, so it's going to be a very limited, very focused hearing. It has to be. It's not going to be looking at all the issues because that's not what the the court is there for. But how is the judge going to decide if they're not looking you at can, it? You can address this in your closing argument. Uh, Councillor Stratford has a question. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I'm just wondering if there is, like, are there, are there any... Um, <coughs> Opportunities. Are there anything? Oh, how, sorry, I'm not going to call you, But is there anything, Fiona and Joe, that um, we could do to come to a compromise? You know, are there any? Is there any give and take? Any can any um, way that we could come to an agreement to get an easement? Tell the councillors today if there's any some of money or any. Um, um, Nego any further negotiating to get that to help us um, reach, you know, get the water in by summer next year. Do you understand that? Sorry. Yeah, agreeing on a route, Dr. Kelly. Agreeing on a route would get it in quickly. What was that, Richard? Agreeing on a route. Yeah, yeah, we are. That's right. And uh, we set out in the submissions that there are some routes that they would agree to. So. That would resolve the So no budging on the one through the paddock. Can we just get some feedback on the green line route? Do, do you mind if I, I just just asked and, and tried and tested with, with Joe and Fiona, if that's OK? So what I would say is, is, is the light blue and, and the red routes, the ones on the boundary, let's go with the light blue route for the moment. It's, there's, a, there's a big difference in estimated cost between the green avocado route and the light blue route. So I'd, I'd like to understand, and the chair mentioned previously, I was trying to say what's changed, and Mrs. King, you, you mentioned that it was the difference uh, the, the distance between the, the drip line or between the trees that, that was causing angst. Have you, when you were doing your parcels, what is that distance that would be optimum for you if there was no pipeline there, i.e. between the two parcels? And if we could come to an agreement that we would 
and I'm going to put loads of Murray's mouth here, if we could find an engineering solution to maintain that distance, um, and I'm not sure how we're going to do it yet, would that really be acceptable? Because there is a big estimated cost difference here between that blue and that green roof. So if, if we could satisfy that concern, would that be amenable to you? Um, what, what you did was you set these time frames really tight about how you wanted to answer straight away. And like I said, the silage has only gone on last week. Yeah. We cannot get a survey in this. This was all costing us money to try and help the council, but the council didn't seem to be very helpful with working with us. Um, We'd have, I'd want to get the guy that's helping us, you know, he's an uh, avocado specialist, the one that's given us that, was it 12 or 14 degrees west of the north? Get him in there, put the, put the line on the ground and then say how far either side of this will, would we have shelter and and the first avocado tree, because his advice was if the council's going to drive down inspecting their water line, we should have that beside the shelter. And because we can't do any of that, the silage is on there, etc. right now, and because we do not know how much water we're actually going to get to, through this consent process with NRC, all of that was up in the air, so it was better off to say just discount that area because there was so many no figures to put into equations like you mentioned about equations everywhere else. There's no figures to put into those equations right now, and you are pushing very hard to get us, which we did to date, spend money on a project that was premature because the project will be one to two million dollars. It's not a cheap thing in order for council to have the preferred pipeline to save the ratepayers money. And the risk is greater for us to have access, as George says, for them to walk through, drive through the middle of an avocado orchard. That is risky in itself with spraying machinery, etc. It's also an equal argument for council cannot wait indefinitely. I know that. That's why we discounted it. A town of 5,000 people that need a secure water supply. So we've got to find that balance. Mr Palmer, I've got a question for you, if you don't mind, and then I'm going to call a break, and then we'll come back for closing arguments, and then we'll call it a day. Um, injurious affection. We've talked a little bit around the compensation that's payable, but it seemed to be focused on a loss to the King's Farm Inspiration for the period of time that we were constructing the pipeline and for the grass to be reinstated. But if we were to follow either of the green lines or the blue lines, that means that that land that the pipeline sits under, I guess forever, can't be built on that's and there will be rules around what can happen. And if we're talking about avocado trees, we're talking about, and I'm still not really clear whether it's 2.5 or 5 metres, but let's say it's 5 metres from the trunk. That technically could be a strip. It's 10 metres wide through the entire farm yep. that forever is locked up and can't be used for anything other than grazing. It's the value as well as set. And yep. so the value captures that for forever? Well, we haven't had a valuation, registered valuation done. We've only done a desktop valuation. Just... But does it capture it? Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Oh. Yes. No. And so what would, when we're sitting here, we're talking about... The pale blue line is significantly more expensive, but we don't know what that looks like. One of the things we need to turn our mind to is what is the dollar value of the compensation? And it might be that they exactly. compensate each other out. Is that possible? Quite, quite right. Yeah, I don't know whether you'd be in the same level um, without doing the, the numbers or that. Um, so we get yeah, it. That sort of uh, area equates to that other area of the blue line as well. So um, you've got that extra width okay. potentially in that area as well. So, you know, it's going to be substantially more. Um, not, quite, not quite a bit, because that, that's a, there's already a, a, a water easement through a good section of that. 
But that's the state it. there all the time. Yes, no, this is mean, it would be a drain on the start down section, so why would there be compensation for that if there's already a decent over it? Well, it would be less, yeah, it would be less. But um, we would have to do the numbers. Yeah, you know, I couldn't now answer you. Just, I'd have to crunch the numbers for that. But you're absolutely right. It's impacted with that injurious infection on the future of that land. Anybody have any follow up questions on compensation? If not, I'm going to call the chairman and chairman for a cup of tea. Oh. Sorry, I just want to make an additional comment on the uh, one kilometre longer length issue. Mm -hmm. We also have to uh, take into consideration we've got one kilometre longer to pump, which means your energy cost will go up also for 50 or 100 years. <coughs> uh, friction, um, so it is one of the councillors, we did look at that. Um, uh, there is a higher, uh, what you call, dynamic head to move the water due to the, the, the longer pipeline. That's why we went up from a class 12.5 to a class 16 pipe. Uh, what we don't know yet is the length of that. Is it half of the pipeline, 30% or 70% that we didn't look at? But just to take into consideration, you've got more water now to move on a, long, well, a longer direction, so your electricity and your operation costs will also go up. Councillor Smith has a question on that. Thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> Based on what you just told me, and I'm not a warning person, most of that went over my head. What I do want to know is do you have an indication of what that costs from an operational point of view? Do you have a clear indication of what the requirements are? So my question is what would the OPEX look like? Yes, so we, sorry, I don't have it with me. We, we did look at, uh, at the um, OPEX costs, but only we can very easily get that. What is the this... time frame would we be looking at for you to look at that? Next week. Guys. Oh, yes. It's 6%. Longer. Thank you for that. Are you had your hand up, Mr. Hill? I'm sorry. 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 I'm sor
substance of a form, I need to actually confirm that the documents were available or not available at high time. I need to take a look at that. But what I do know for sure is that every single one of the landowners that have been where were affected got a letter and got a copy of the plans and the diagrams. So I know that all the affected parties got it. And Albury Holdings in this particular instance cannot claim to be prejudiced in any way because they have been terribly up with the plan in terms of the documentation and the plans that were given to them. So that is an issue that we need to actually take a look at. And so there may be that one technicality which we need to find out a little bit more about. The issue with the light blue route is that we don't know anything about it. It is, it's, it's from, from our side, there is no engineering on it, there is no environmental assessments, there is no historic uh, trust assessments, there is nothing on it. We don't have any information on that route whatsoever. We've got a, a very rough estimate on its cost. Uh, we've also been told by the engineer that there's a number of, 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 of serious and potential risks, one being the, the, the the, the, the increase in the quality of the pipe came from point to 16, I think it was. And then there's also, and that depends on the head, that there's going to be an increase in the operational costs going that particular route. And there's also going to be an increase in the, um, maybe an increase in the pipe size itself, which will basically increase the pump size and increase the, the what's it? Because from my understanding of, of, of that type of hydraulic engineering, it is that you it all relates to the friction and the size of the head. So the, the wider, the bigger the pipe, uh, the further it can actually push the water uh, effectively. So it really is going to be dependent on that. Um, and I don't really have that engineering, but we need to determine that before we can really properly assess that light period of it. And it's really a good question just one at a time. If we have an appeal, uh, which I'll be holding that really if we go to the adopted routes that really clearly that signal that to us today and probably all along the line, then effectively we're going to be looking at going to the district court and you'll be probably looking at a hearing at the earliest in June, but it's, it's going to be anybody's guess, so there's going to be a significant delay in terms of time. Um, one of the things we have to know is in terms of Section 181 and this trial schedule is that we can't commence any work on the Albury Farms property until such time as the court has actually heard the matter. But that doesn't mean that we cannot do other work in the interim. And it may just mean that we should do the work until we have that hearing. The evaluations, the valuation, as I said, and just to repeat myself, the valuation will be determined by an independent valuer from both sides. Yes, there may be desktop, desktop, desktop valuations are clearly there to give an indication. Um, and it really depends on what those values take into consideration. And if the values can't agree on a value, then it goes before a valuation tribunal, which is open to anybody in terms of the public work center. So that's the way that that value is going to be determined. So if we can't quite agree a value, then that's the way to go to. Um, but that doesn't necessarily have to hold up the project. It can be something that can be agreed that the work goes ahead and the value, the payment is determined afterwards. I think that's all the points I wish to make.